Hi, this is Gordon Parker from Michigan Tech, and in this video we're going to go through a special case of system type for Unity Feedback Systems, and then explore how we can use this information to help frame our control system design. So, to get started, let's draw the black diagram of the system that we'll be considering here. Okay, so we have a controller, and I'm going to write that like so. It's a rational function, and it has a numerator n1 and a denominator that's sp, s to the p, times d1. So it's as though I factored out all of the poles at the origin out of the denominator. And I'll do the same thing for the plant, but I'll just call it n2 s to the r d2s there we go and again this is a special case where the system the control system is unity feedback so I have a reference input here and a disturbance input there and now in this form if we want to determine the system type with respect to R, the reference input, it's real simple. It's just P plus R, where P is the number of poles at the origin of this controller, and R is the number of poles at the origin of the plant. And the type with respect to the disturbance is just equal to P the number of poles at the origin of the controller. It's that simple. So instead of having to do all kinds of steady state error analysis and all of that stuff, we can just do this. Now there is one caveat. The system must be stable. Okay, so you can do this as a, as a first cut, but then you do have to check that the system is stable and that the steady state error is actually bounded. Okay, let's do an example. And um, what we'll do is we'll say that our plant, g of s, is equal to s squared plus 6s plus 13 divided by s, s squared plus 4. So what we have is a plant that has a couple of imaginary poles, pure imaginary poles, and it also has a pole at the origin. Then it has a couple zeros, and those zeros are also uh, complex. If you look at that, s squared plus 6s plus 13. So if we were to look at just the plant, we'd have a pole at the origin, a couple poles here and here from the s squared plus 4, and then a couple zeros out here somewhere. This is the real and imaginary axes. Now we just need to specify the design requirements. And we'll have two of them. It has to be able to track a step in the reference input in R. And it has to be able to reject step disturbances in steady state. SS for steady state. So basically I'm just uh, couching the design requirements in terms of system type. So from this we can see that if it needs to track a step in R, it needs to be type 1 with respect to the reference input. And if it has to be able to reject step disturbances, it also has to be type 1 with respect to the disturbance. Okay, well let's try something. We've said nothing about what the controller should look like, so what we'll do is just put our G right there, and we'll just try something. We'll try the simplest controller we can possibly come up with, just to get us started. And here we have a proportional controller. This is a this is our plant G of S, and this is just a scalar control.
control design parameter K, so a proportional controller. Now our G of S, just as a reminder, G of S was equal to S squared plus 6S plus 13 over S, S squared plus 4. Now, if we go ahead and look at our system type um, if we go ahead and look at our system type rules that we started on the previous page, we can see that what we have here with a proportional controller is type 1 with respect to R, right? Because I have one pole at the origin here, and I have zero poles at the origin here. So I add those two up, and I get the system type with respect to R, and it's 1. And it is type 0 with respect to W, because I have no poles at the origin in the controller. So this controller is not going to meet our design requirements. Well, let's try another case. Since we know that we need to increase the number of poles at the origin of, of the controller, let's just go ahead and do that. So we'll make the controller an integrator with a gain on it, so k over s. And here's our g again, and boom. And now we have a system that is type 2 with respect to r, because there is one pole at the origin here, one pole at the origin there, and it's type 1 with respect to w. So this satisfies our control design requirements that we had on the previous page. But now let's go ahead and check stability. So what I'll do is I'll just scoot this down a little bit, and that enough so that we can form a closed loop transfer function. So y over r is, let's see, k s squared plus 6s plus 13 over s squared s squared plus 4. That's our loop transfer function in the numerator divided by 1 plus that same loop transfer function. And there we go. Multiply this out and we get this in the numerator and in the denominator we get s to the fourth plus 4 plus k s squared plus 6k s plus 3k. Now, I could also find the transfer function between y and w, but for stability I just need the characteristic equation, which is this. And the characteristic equation is going to be the same for all of these transfer functions. So I can really just focus on this in terms of assessing stability. And we have a problem. I don't even need to do much stability analysis for this. I can see that I'm missing the s cubed coefficient. So let me scoot this up. I'm missing an s cubed. So I know that this thing is going to be unstable. I know that all of its roots are not going to be in the left half plane. So all of my system type analysis that I did above, where I found that it was type 2 with respect to the reference and type 1 with respect to the disturbance, is really a moot point. It's not applicable because the system is unstable no matter what I do with k. So that design is not going to work. Well, let's try another one. I now know that I need a pole at the origin in my controller, but I also know that I need to get all those coefficients into the characteristic equation. So here's what I could do. I could add a zero to that controller. And I'll just put it at s plus a. Now, when I form the closed loop transfer function, and I'll just do it between y and r, where this is, oops, this is y, um, 
Let's see what I get. So y over r, let's see my loop transfer function is k s plus a s squared plus 6s plus 13 divided by s squared, s squared plus 4. And then I have 1 plus that same thing in the denominator. And let me move down a little bit so that I can work all this out. Okay, so we get y over r is equal to k s plus a s squared plus 6s plus 13 in the numerator. And for my characteristic equation, I'll multiply the top and bottom by this quantity. And so again, I'll get s the fourth. I'll get a 4s squared plus k s plus a s squared plus 6s plus 13. And I should write that out in a little bit more detail. And I'll have the characteristic equation finally. Let's see, s the fourth plus k s cubed plus 4 plus k times the quantity 6 plus a s squared plus 13 plus 6a k times s plus 13 a k. Great. It's a fully populated characteristic equation. It goes its fourth order and it has uh, terms everywhere in it. it has two design parameters a and k. There's a good chance I can pick a and k to make that thing stable. I also know that the system is type two with respect to R, and it's still type one with respect to W because of all those poles at the origin. So it looks like I could meet all the requirements. Now, how can I come up with bounds on K and A to make sure that this thing is going to be stable? Well, I could use a Routh array and get a number of equations that tell me um, what the bounds are on K and A for stability. That'll get pretty complicated pretty quick. Um, what I'll do instead is I'll just try A equals 3 and I'll get a simpler characteristic equation in only one variable, K, and then I'll do the Routh array on that and see what sort of bounds I have on K. So let's see, if I use A equals 3, my characteristic equation is this. 9k plus 4s squared plus 31ks plus 39k. Great. So now let's go ahead and do our Routh array. So I'm going to get a little bit more room here. And here we go. S the fourth, s cubed. I better give myself a little bit of room there and there. So I have a 1, 9k plus 4, and 39k, k, 31k, 0. OK, so here I'll have, let's see, 9k squared plus 4k, when I multiply these two together, minus 31k divided by k. So what I get from all of that, I can simplify out a k, so I get a 9k minus 27, and I'll go ahead and circle that, because that's really the element of the, the correct entry for the Routh array. And then I'll have k times 39k minus 0 divided by k, so I just get 39k. Great. Now I take this one and multiply it by that one, and let's see, I'll have 31 times 9. That is 279k squared 
and then 31 times 27, that's minus 837k minus that, 39k squared, divided by 9k minus 27. And I can simplify that. I'll have 240k minus 837 the whole thing times k over 9k minus 27. And I better circle that. And this element is 0. And then for this last element, I have this times this minus 0, because that times that, divided by this thing. So I just get 39k. There we go. So these three circled quantities well, actually, this one, too, those all have to be greater than zero. So let's, well, actually, I can use this part of the area to work all that out. So from this one and this one, I get that k has to be greater than zero. From this one, I have 9k minus 27 has to be greater than zero. So that tells me that k has to be greater than 3. Okay, And from this one, assuming that k is greater than 0, and also that k is greater than 3, then I can boil this down to just 240k minus 837 has to be greater than 0. And that tells us that k has to be greater than 3.49. If I look at these three conditions, this one, is the most restrictive. K is going to have to be greater than 3.49. Now, what's also interesting about that is if I choose K equal to 3.49, this is 0. That means that the whole row, the whole S1 row, is 0. And so I get an auxiliary equation based on this row which would be 9 times 3.49 minus 27 times s squared. So this would be 4.4 s squared plus 39 times k. So that will be 136.1. The roots of that auxiliary equation are also roots of the characteristic equation. And the roots of this thing are plus minus 5 point, roughly 5.6j. So now we know that if I set k equal to this, I'll have closed loop poles on the imaginary axis. If I make k greater than 3.49, then all of my poles will be in the left half plane. Presumably, if I make k less than 3.49, my poles will be in the right half plane. So that's just a little bit of extra information. Now, just to back up a minute and look at what we did, is we had a plant, and we had a design requirement on system type. We tried a couple different control laws, and we finally homed in on one that would allow us to make the system stable, and therefore attain the system type goals that we laid out based on the form of the controller, basically having a pole at the origin. And the form of that controller, I'll just stick it back up in here just as a reminder, was k s plus a over s. Now this type of controller actually has a very, um, this type of controller has a name, it's called a PI controller, and we'll get into that in another video. So with a, this type of controller, with the PI controller, we're able to stabilize the system and hit our system type goals. But now let's go ahead and play with this a little bit in MATLAB and explore what happens for different values of k as we take k above 3.49. Okay, let's fire up Simulink and we'll start with a new model. And I'm gonna stretch this out a little bit so that we see everything properly. Let's grab a transfer function for our plant, another one for our controller, and how about under math, we'll grab a summing junction, a 
Also a gain, we'll need that to turn our uh, inputs on and off as needed. There we go. And now I'll grab a step from our sources and a scope from our sinks. Okay, so this will be our reference input. Might as well denote, denote that as R. And that will go up here. Here's our feedback. This is Y. And we'll bring that right back into here. Make that make those oops, make those signs correct. There we go. Oops. And bring our disturbance in. And need another input for our disturbance, another step. Why? I'll grab another scope because I can look at the error quite easily from this signal. Right? That is R minus Y, so that is the error. I guess I can double click on this line and label it too. And what else? Oh, well, we need to put in the proper plant. So 1613. And the denominator was, let's see, it was S squared plus 4 with another S. So it would be S, oops, it would be S cubed, 0 S squared, a 4 S 0. That looks about right. And our controller was K times S plus 3 over s. And so now what we'll do is is define k in the workspace. How about pick k equal 5? It's a little bit bigger than 3.5, so it should be a little bit better than just barely stable. The pole should be off of the imaginary axis and in the left half plane. Let's go ahead and set up the simulation environment. Uh, and that's fine. And we'll use a thousand hertz type uh, time step. Maybe we'll let this run a little bit. 30 seconds. And let's just look at the step response first. So I'll set that to zero. And off we go. Ah, now notice we don't see the whole time history. If I go into this little gear on the plot and I select history, I can unselect the limiting of the data points. Might as well do that in both places. History, unselect. I can now close that down. Rerun it. And there's my response. Ooh, nice. It goes right to 1. My step input is 1. It goes to 1, just like it should. Because it should be system type 2 with respect to the reference input. So 0 steady state error for a step input. And that's what I have. And I could actually switch this to a ramp and still have zero steady state error. Let's do that. That could be fun. So here's a ramp. And I'll get rid of this. Put a ramp in there. And of course, this is still R. And run it. Now there's my output Y. It looks very ramp-like. And here's my error. Look at that. Nice. It oscillates around a little bit and then it gets right down to business. It gets down to zero. Now if I put a parabola in the reference input, it would have a constant steady state error. But let's not go to that extreme. Uh, let's go ahead and turn this off. And turn this on. And see if our disturbance rejection properties are holding up. Oh yeah, a little bit of bouncing around, and then y goes to zero. And of course the reference input is zero now, so that's exactly where it should be going. We can look at the error, and that is also going right to zero. Now we do have quite a bit of oscillation in here. 
Now, whether that's good or bad really depends on what other types of design requirements you have for this control system. But let's go ahead and try something where we just increase k a little bit. So I'll make k equal to, oh, let's just double it, make it 10. And let's have this error up here again. We'll run it. Look at that. Much less oscillation, much less error. It, um, it gets down to zero very quickly. Now, you might say, well, why not just take k equal to 100 or k equal to 1,000? Why not? Right? I get better and better performance. Well, let's take a look at another quantity on an output. We're going to look at this. This is the input to the plant. And the way to think about this is that if you had some sort of actuator that was affecting the plant, in other words, applying a force to it, a moment, um, power, etc., it's the amount of effort needed to make that plant do what it's doing. There's usually a cost associated with that. The bigger the motor, for instance, the more cost in the system. So now let's go ahead and look at what happens with you for, let's take this back to a step, for our reference input as a function of different gains. So we have k equal 5, we have nothing in the disturbance, and we have a um, reference input that's a unit step. Great. Let's run this, and here's our u. So quite a bit of oscillation, u jumps up to 5 and dies out eventually in about 10 seconds. Now I'll take k equal to, let's just take it up to 100 and try it again. Now our u jumps up to 100 instead of about 5. Now of course y is very nice, be, nicely behaved. Very quick responding system, hardly any oscillation, and it, it damps out extremely quickly. But that's at the price of a very large amount of effort applied to that plant. So the moral of this story is that while it's tempting to keep increasing k to get better and better performance, a faster y response, there's a cost associated with that in terms of how much actuation has to be applied to the plant. So just to summarize, we started off with just a very quick introduction to how you can determine system type for unity feedback systems. But the real interesting thing about that is that once we're armed with that information, then we can tackle the, design, the control design problem. Then we worked through that with a particular example. But that led us down the path of having to investigate stability and stability with respect to different design parameters, in our case K and A. And then finally, we just had a little bit of fun with it and looked at the trade-off between performance, how much oscillation we get, and how quickly the system settles out as a function of k, versus how much control effort is required for different values of k. So again, this is Gordon Parker from Michigan Tech, and thanks for watching.